Jesus. Hallelujah. Today we heard uh, two powerful testimonies and uh, I think this is a this time um, of sharing what Jesus has done for us during the breaking of bread is really encouraging people. Um, um, so many people with their different stories, so many different stories. Um, we heard this morning one to care, to cares for God to respond, um, this is the way, and Simone said immediately here, I mean, why God does this? I don't know, but that's your story, and this is everybody's story, you know? Everybody has his own story. So praise Jesus for that. Um, um, today, we're going to um, start our study um, on chapter four, the book of uh, Thessalonians, First Thessalonians. Um, um, we already gone through three chapters, and then this fourth chapter is um, quite filled with theology and also practical ways of how God expects us to live our Christian life. Um, in this chapter, we find four different themes. The larger theme is on the subject of holiness. Um, we also find um, the doctrine of uh, brotherly love. We also find a subject which does, we don't really talk much about it, and that is the productivity productivity of the Christian, productivity in the world, in the workforce, actually. And also, we find um, um, the, the second half of the chapter speaks about one of the most talked about subject, and that is the second coming of the Lord, which uh, refers one of the few places that refers to what we call the rapture. But we'll get to that some other time. Today we're going to concentrate on holiness. When we read this passage that we just heard, we conclude that there are things in our life things that God expects in order to please him. As already mentioned that uh, everybody knows today is Father's Day. Some still have their fathers around, some don't. Yet there is a father who is always there. And every day belongs to our Father's Day. So every day belongs to God Almighty, our Father. Yes, we do believe and we stress and insist on the Lord's Day, which is today, Sunday, but as we know, every day belongs to God. There is a word there in the verse 1, which I would like to briefly mention where it says, finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord, Jesus, that as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God just as what you are doing. And the word I want to use is the word walk. Walk. 
the word walk is, like many other words, can be used literally or in a figurative way. In the literal way, it refers to someone who's having a stroll, and in this stroll, he looks at things and examines them. Bible scholars sometimes refer to um, someone who is walking in a garden and examines those flowers that are in the garden. Um, and this reference is used for when it revelation we find when Jesus walking in the midst of the church. Okay? So in the figurative way, walking is walking your life and examining. Here Paul is using it spiritually and he is expecting us that when we walk our Christian walk, our Christian life, we examine ourselves as we go along. And therefore, if we want to please our Father, because every single day and every single moment of our life belongs to Him, we need to ask ourselves if we are pleasing our God. And that is what the, uh, Paul says, um, the teaching, the, the instructions in some translations, what you receive from us in others is the same word which um, means or comes from the word of command. You see, when we read instruction or we read teaching, we, we, we refer, uh, we can use another word in Greek, the daskalos, but here it's not the laskalos. It refers to a commandment. And today, we live in a life that we don't want anyone to command us anything. Paul actually did command the church because he was commanding a group of people that although he was praising from chapter 1 up to chapter 3, he was praising them and showing them how a good example they are. He's pleased that even other cities around Thessalonica heard about the Christian attitude, the love that these people had for Jesus. But because this church was born in the Roman Greco culture, then immorality was the rule of the day. You wake up and you can ask yourself, what I am going to be immoral with today? It was the normal thing to do. Be immoral. And here we have Paul, we have Silas, we have Luke, and we have Timothy, the pastor in training, going to the Thessalonica. Remember, they just ran away from Philippi after being imprisoned and flocked, Paul and Silas. And they come with this new contra-culture philosophy. They come with a teaching which was totally different than it was the norm of the day. I might remind you that in the time of Paul, they didn't have Twitter, they didn't have Facebook, they didn't have Instagram, they didn't have Facebook and all the other stuff. They didn't have any of that. So they couldn't receive a post from somebody saying, look what happened in Jerusalem. You know, this group of people calling them this, this, and this, and they are doing this and the other, and this is the new teaching. They had no idea what was going on in Jerusalem. And it, whatever else Paul was preaching. So Paul and his team goes to Thessalonica and preach a gospel and telling them this lifestyle you are living is sinful in the eyes of God, the creator 
of the heavens and of the earth. And I could imagine say, the people they're saying, oh, what are you talking about? And that's why in sermons, some sermons ago, I preached about the different kind of words Paul used to describe his preaching approach to the Thessalonians. The whole goal was to persuade them that they need to turn to Jesus. He had to persuade them that there is sin and that their lifestyle is sinful. And I think we can all agree, at some level at least, that we still need to preach the same gospel today in our land. As many people were praying for children even this morning and making the point that we need to protect them from the teachings that they are experiencing in their life, there is going to be a time when we speak when holiness or sanctification or sexual immorality would be something that they need to go and search on the internet. What does sexual immorality mean? Because we, as grown-ups, much more our children are being bombarded with sexual immorality to make it the norm. I just read this morning about a protest some mothers made in England because they were given the impression that the curriculum is this, but they found out that the curriculum is totally different and they are teaching their little kids to do sexual things. I don't have to repeat the word. I don't feel comfortable saying it. And this is what's happening around the world. And the fact that Paul is speaking about or against sexual immorality. He supports that phrase by saying, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. And then he specifies that you abstain from sexual immorality. How do you do that? By each one of you, know how to control his own body. How? In holiness and in honor, not in passion of the lust, like the Gentiles do. My goodness. Self-control, the opposite of what Freudian teaching is. What our universities, you've been here, coming here to this church for some years, you heard me teach about these things. Where you have to feel free to express yourself, especially in the sexual areas, so that you don't feel trapped. And you know what? There are more young people suffering in depression today than in the time when it was understood that sexual immorality is what it is, a sexual sin. That's the truth. That's the science they tell us to follow. There are more people, young people suffering today with all kinds of sexual disease and mental problems because of the so-called liberty that the Romans and the Greeks had. You see, God wants us to be holy because he is holy. There is no other way. And there is no middle roads, and there is no way of how we can find or excuse sin. There is no way of how we can excuse sin in our life and in our culture. And therefore, because we still live in the, sa in the same immoral culture, the moral climate that we have. We need to take notice of what Paul is saying to us today through the book of the First Thessalonians. 
Self-control is important. It is the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit, one of the facets. You know that there are nine facets. There are not nine fruits of the Spirit. It is one fruit with nine different facets. And one of those facets is self-control. God doesn't want our mind to run away. In fact, Peter says you must gird the mind, which means it's like you tie a belt, the belt that they used to, the soldiers used to tie with their gown so that their gown will not be in the way while they are running and fighting. He used the same word to gird with our mind. So our mind would not fly everywhere. We will keep it under control of the Holy Spirit so we won't think on the lusts. And if the lusts come, we will overcome by the blood of the Lamb. They overcame him by the words of their testimony and by the blood of the Lamb. That means the salvation that Jesus has given us. The salvation that God has provided for us in Christ so we can overcome the evil one. Hallelujah. Temptations are strong. For new Christians and for older Christians, and Paul is addressing this matter in the book of Thessalonians. But if we want to walk this walk that I mentioned earlier, we walk our Christian life as we walk, we examine ourselves. I like walking. I enjoy walking. I, I thank God I can even jog a little bit as well, especially after three heart attacks, you know, and nearly one and a half years after, and I can walk 10 kilometers, and some of that I jog, and I really am blessed. Um, I can't say I really enjoy the views, because everywhere you look is concrete coming up, and fields being unrooted, and so forth, but it was a time, there was a time which, ah, nice fresh air. Now if you look, you know, it's dust and, and everything else. However, there is still the feeling that somehow, um, if, you, if, if you really don't take any notice of the trucks and cranes passing by, um, you feel, in a way, you are with God. Especially when you see that little green. I, I like the part when I get to Madeleine. At least there is a, bit, a nice small, a small stretch, but it's nice that you can look and see green, and you can see a valley, and you can see, a, you know, further on the valley being built, but anyhow. Um, but at least there's some fresh air around, you know. And, you, and this week I told Chris, I, said, I, was, I, I started thanking God. I, how on earth, after going through what I went through, I'm doing this walk and I'm doing this run, and I said, I thank you. And when I said that, or maybe a few minutes later, this scripture came to mind. I said, yes, but it's my walk. I enjoy my walk, but is God enjoying my walk with him? The, the, the reason is, I'm asking myself, is my life pleasing to God? And it's amazing what, can come, what you can come up with when you start really looking deep in your heart and notice your attitudes, the thoughts, and maybe the words that you want to choose and say, this will not definitely please God. There is a word in the Bible which you call self-examination. And this is what I'm talking about. We need to examine ourselves to see if we are walking in holiness. Praise God. If we want to please God, as we read, there are three things, or maybe four things. One of them is walking in holiness. The other one is obedience. I mentioned the word commandments earlier. It was the word that um, the military used in those days. Even today, you, the, 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 the officer will come and will command a soldier or a group of soldiers to move forward against all opposition and enemy and machine gun fire and mortars falling around. And the officer says, charge. You've seen those films, right? And by obedience, 
risking their life. They go out of those trenches, like in the world, world First World War and so on, and they go through those bullets that their people cut in half, but because they obey their commandment, they crossed the lines. They won the war or lost it, depends. But that's the word that Paul uses here. And in fact, it makes us uncomfortable because as I tried to say earlier, we feel uncomfortable when people command us to do something. Who does he think he is? Even at work, the boss comes around. And in church, people don't like being told what to do. The point is when preachers preach, they are not concerned about commanding you. They are concerned about you walking with God so that you can please your father. That's the point. We can talk about how good we are and that you are a son of, you know, Gretz, you are a child of the king. You know, you just look at yourself like that. They are preaching like that. They will never go into the deep of the hearts and say, Gretz, I know that you are of certain day, but take care of yourself, brother. Don't lose your testimony. You know, encouraging. But if I see somebody, I'm not going, you know, just an example. That doesn't mean we have somebody, somebody doing it here. But if I see a drunkard, a sexual immoral, a gambler, it is my responsibility like it is everybody's responsibility and say, your life is not pleasing God. You need to obey the commandments. Now, I told that one day to somebody, you need to obey. You are a legalistic, he said. Yeah, okay. Don't tell me what you want to tell me, but the Bible doesn't change. Yes, if, it, if it's legalistic, so what? It is legalistic because if God says do not do it, it will remain do not do it. Do you find anywhere in the Bible where we can break any one of the Ten Commandments that we are free to break any one of the commandments? No. Those who say you are a legalistic, they don't know, even know the word, what it means. So I won't go there right now. Another thing we need to do is understand the fact that my life, as I examine it, somehow I can say I am genuinely trying to live my life for the glory of God. I may miss it a few times or many times, but at least my desire is to live my life for the glory and praise to God. If I look into my life and say, oh, you know, whenever I feel like it, I obey. When I feel like it, I do this. When I feel like it, I do the other. And that, my brother, my sister, if you are in that category, I tell you, you better check yourself and see, first of all, if you're saved. If you've tasted the goodness of the Lord, you will want more and more of God. It's like when you're drinking Coke or Pepsi or Kinney or Dr. Pepper. You like that drink, so you go and what? You go to a bar, to a restaurant. And, well, you, oh, I want a Kinney. I want a, I want a fizzy water because I like that drink. Okay, there may be sometimes you'll get fed up of it and order something else. And it happens in the spiritual life. We know that God is good and we enjoy being with God. And sometimes we fall a little backwards and, you know, sin a little bit. But then you realize, hey, my drink is this. And my life is Jesus. Wherever I go, wherever I try to find refuge in, if, when times are difficult and seems to be impossible, where I'm going to run to? And wherever you run to, you will say, ah, I should have gone to Jesus. He is the way to the Father. He is the one that invites me to give my burdens to him. And there is one other thing which is important here is sanctification. The will of God is sanctification. We hear about sanctification and we hear of holiness. This is the same word, hagios. The way they translate, the, the translation use different words for their own reason. Maybe not to use the same word, synonymous word, but it's the same word. Even in this chapter, when you greet God is holy and sanctification is the same word. If we want to walk with God, we need to live the life of sanctification. 
God called us for purity and holiness. That's his calling. We cannot live in sin. We cannot give way to sin. We cannot accommodate sin. God is holy. And if we look into the Bible, which I hope next Tuesday we'll have the opportunity, we're going to see the importance of walking with God, what it means and what we should be doing. In order to conclude, because time is over already, earlier I said that <clears throat> Paul and his team went to a city which the order of the day was immorality. And they started preaching to them. They preached Jesus. We say they preached the gospel. And when someone preached, hears the gospel, then we say we receive Jesus, or we say um, we are born again. When we receive Jesus and when we are born again, it's not when we say a prayer and somebody may give us a card and say, you've been born again on so-and-so day at this time. Welcome to the church. Welcome to the body of Christ. In order to be born again, there must be, first of all, repentance. The doctrine of salvation has ten different facets. It's still one doctrine, but for us to understand it, we need to split it a little bit so we can understand what's going on in our life. Repentance is one of them. We must make a decision to turn away from our sin. That's where it starts from. If you say, I believe in Jesus, and you do not make a commitment to turn away from sin, you have not repented. And without repentance, there cannot be forgiveness. Then we have faith. I'm going to read through them quickly. Faith, believing in who Jesus is and what he has done, it's not the faith that you believe that Napoleon lived and um, um, the grandmasters were immortal. It's not that type of faith. It's putting your total trust for your soul in the person of Jesus. This is the faith that we are talking about. Then there will be a conversion, a turning around. There will be the regeneration, the aspect of born again. That's where you get born again. That's the point where you get born again. And then there is justification. We, we've spent one and a half, uh, one year talking about the, the doctrine of justification. Just a few months ago, we finished. Eh? The, the standing of God, that's part, part of the doctrine. There is adoption. We are adopted in the family of God. And adoption is not what we understand today. It's totally different than what, how people understood it in the first century. If somebody adopts you, you know, that baby could be a grown-up, you could be a slave and adopted into a family, and then your duty is to form yourself according to the culture of that clan or of that family, and you will speak about in favor of your new father who gave you a home and is giving you feed and protecting you and feeding your family. When you are adopted in the family, you live for the ruler of that family. And that's what it means when Paul was saying we are adopted through Jesus into this new family. We now live for the sole reason of making God, our father, known into the sinful world. That's what adoption means. And then we come to the issue of sanctification, of cleaning ourselves. In Jesus, we are cleansed. But John says, keep purifying yourself as you are already, uh, you are already pure. And then the last one, which will come to it uh, in the, the, the second part of the chapter something which we are supposedly looking forward to, and that is the doctrine of glorification. Hallelujah. You know, one day, we are all going to be glorified. Think about that. We were children of wrath. We were condemned. We were destined to only one place, and that's the fires of hell. 
And Jesus came, did what he did on the cross, so that we, instead of going to hell, we go into the glorification that he has now with the Father. Praise God. You see how important it is to examine ourselves, our walk. As we walk our Christian life, our walk Christian life is not from home to come to church on Sunday. Walk a few steps up and come up, you know, walk up the steps here. The stairs, I mean. That's not your Christian walk. That's your body moving to come into a place where you can worship God with others that believe like you. But your Christian walk is outside the building. Your Christian walk is when you go shopping, when you are filling your income tax papers, and everything else. It's when you see that handsome man go crossing by her, that beautiful woman crossing the road, that's where your sanctification kicks in. That's your Christian walk. It's being a testimony of Jesus Christ. So brothers and sisters, God willing, we will examine more this teaching next Tuesday. We'll have more time. Meanwhile, I leave you with this. Remember what God called you for. Verse 7. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, the preacher or the teacher, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. God bless you as you walk the walk with Christ.